So we're heading toward Clayton and the Jack and Jill windmills are on that hill yonder and it's got hot, <laughs> which is lovely after yesterday. You can see who else uses this path. Horsey folk. And honestly, it's probably better suited to horses than boots because this chalk, when it's wet, is slidey and slippery. Especially when there's an overlay of clay. It just holds water and trips you up. Okay, staff time. How deep is your mud? Is your mud? How deep is your mud? I really need to know. Cause I'm walking in a land of clay. Overlaying on chalk. Don't want to go up to my knees. Oh star, just tell me please. Do 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 do. You've got to love the South Downs. Not so much for the, the green deserts on top. Although they have great vistas and a sense of isolation. But these bostels, the that's what they call them locally, bostels and twittons, which lead down from the chalk tops to the lowlands below. These connective ligaments are usually the most biodiverse, beautiful spots. Beautiful ash. No sense of die back there. Well, I hope not. I believe there's none. Go ash, go. And the other great tree cover is these amazing beech trees. I mean, look at her. And the old English name for a beech tree is Bok. Right? And Bok is the same root that gave us the word book. And in German, the word for a letter, you know, an alphabetic letter is Buchstabe, beech staff. So there's some connection between our literary roots, words and writing, and the beech tree, which is pretty much always the tree that people write on. Now, what is it that we remember about that connection that impels young people today to say, DV loves BG, 2001? You know, do they know about the Bok root? I doubt it, but somehow the beech tree offers that written opportunity. And you may say, look, you're carving on a living being, bad. And yeah, I, mean, I would agree with that point of view. I wouldn't write my own name on a beech tree and I wouldn't recommend anyone else does, but I somehow forgive those who do because I think it comes from a very old instinct. Clayton. Come Holly. Good girl. I'm going to shut the gate behind you. Here we are. Hard to guess. The church will be open. Wow, that's an incredibly evocative tomb. Just the bones remain. So before you go into an ancient church, I always would say, Circumambulate. Walk the circuit around. Wow. Honestly, so beautiful. And you know what? This would make a pucker place to sleep, eh? Look at that. Flat as a pancake. Beautifully sheltered under a beech tree. Unlikely to disturb anyone. Yeah, I'd camp here, between you and me. This counts as an open porch opportunity. If it's storming outside, this is a perfectly good sleeping space for your humble pilgrim. Look at that. I've slept in a bunch of church porches. And let me tell you, they're pretty good. Let's see if the church is open. Come on, St. John's. Come on, St. John's. Come on. Ah. Mm. Mm. 
One more go. Certain lock. That lock the keyhole. Thank you very much. Bye. All right, the very best to you. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you. Well. Take care. Bye now. Bye. So we came down the hill for a wonderful closed church, and now we're going back up the hill to some windmills, which are also going to be closed. Now look at this path. It's kind of perfect. Wait. One way, two ways, or three ways. I'm going to take the VMADR, the middle path. Up, up, and away we go. Up, up, and away. Wah, 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 wah. Up, up, and away we go. Up, up and away, wah, 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 wah. Where we're going, we don't knowing, but we're going there no way. Yes, we do, yes, we will. Yes, we always shall, and we're going to the places we've never been, but once or twice before. Wah, 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 wah. This is your classic South Downs Vista. Dropping away into the wooded weald below, on your left, and to the right, somewhere over there, the sea. The shining sea. The sheep are quite happy. So that I want to bring it to this. It's kind of an artificially imposed barrenness, in my opinion. Historically, we have evidence that the downs have been relatively bare for a really long time. Here's one aspect of our human involvement in the downs that really has brought diversity. And this is the uh, dew pond puddle clay lined pits to collect the rainwater and create a water source where there is otherwise none. And it also creates this amazing diversity and a place for the holly dogs to have a drink and cool in their little white feet. Hey big girl, is it okay? As you're walking the south downs which have I mentioned is super mega glorious. You'll come across these little lumps and bumps. You may wonder what's that. What they are is tumps. Lumps and bumps are tumps. And tumps are basically burial mounds of heroes, kings and queens, great people. And mostly they're probably empty because grave robbers have been as much a part of the tradition of the South Downs as anything else. But when I stand on one, I like to say, hey, if you're underneath here, Sleeping Kings, the time is coming soon to rise. Boom. That's what I tell them anyway. Because, you know, we might need a re-risen Arthur to come and kick some serious whatnot sometime soon. One of the great things about the South Downs is constant reveals. I mean, yeah, you've got that vista on the left, England forever. And probably not on this camera, but I can see the North Downs far, far beyond the weald. The other ancient wayfarer's route to Canterbury. Oldest song of the lark. As was heard by that mockling throng And I wished I was back in old England oh, Where I did once belong Where I did once belong So I'm walking toward Lewis and Lewis is a great centre of freedom Historically And kind of today still it's where every November the 5th they have the most absurd, unhealth and safety conscious fireworks parade. Oh, 
I just like how extreme they are and how little they care about what this should be doing. Okay, here's our reveal. It's actually only showing us another micro hill. But anyway, on our way to Lewis. And one of Lewis's great claims to fame is in 1264, there was the Battle of Lewis between Henry III, his brother Richard and his son Edward, and Simon de Montfort. And Simon was just a noble, one of the barons, and he won. He won the battle. And that forced Henry III to accept the first English parliament. The first time the monarchic power of the royals was effectively broke. And the parliament of commoners, although let's be honest, they weren't commoners, they were a bunch more nobles and, and super rich. A bit like today. But they got a say in how the country was run. Simon de Montfort didn't last long at the Battle of Evesham. Sometime later, he was cut into bits by um, Henry III's son, Edward, who became Edward Longshanks, famous for smashing everyone. He's not a nice guy to be on a battle against, anyway. But for a little while, Simon de Montfort in Lewis created our first English parliament back in the mid 13th century. So that's a big, big deal, yeah, Lewis. Also Thomas Paine, the revolutionary writer of the rights of man, who had a big part to play in the American Revolution in terms of the intellectual background for it. He lived in Lewis. So Lewis is kind of banging. It's a place of freedom. Hey, there's a little tump there. Let's just go say hello quickly. You never know what heroes, freedom fighters and radicals might be buried below. Hello. You ancient dead, how go you? How goes your rest? Kaboom. Rise when the time is right. Thank you. It's got cold, but it hasn't rained. And I have one more hill to cover before Lewis. City of radicalism. Small town of mild occasional disturbance. That, by the way, was the Black Cat. Don't know why it's called that. It wasn't very black or cappy. There's some good scrubland up here. You could almost certainly camp up here, William, actually. But I do fancy a big fat supper, I must be honest. And a pint of beer. So there's that. All right, see you on the battle site. This is the viewpoint that began English parliamentary democracy. In 1264, May the 14th, Simon de Montfort and his army of baronial upstarts, including a bunch of London citizens, stood up here and faced off King Henry III. And why this is significant is because Simon de Montfort, which I think must mean Montfort, a strong hill, he won. He won the battle. And Simon de Montfort, having won this battle, imposed a parliament on the king. And the king obviously hated it. He no longer had the monarchic prerogative of whatever I say goes. And this led directly to the parliament we have today and the rights of technically anyone to represent us and have a hand in making our laws fair for all. And I think this is significant because right now under the, um, the rule of SPAD, Special Advisor Cummings, Dominic Cummings, we have this unelected, unexplained quasi-dictator who's pissing all over Parliament. So that's why this matters now. This is the viewpoint from which Simon de Montfort won parliamentary democracy for England. Now, how do you celebrate that? Well, we have one survival from this period, one cultural response, and that's known as the song, the Battle of Lewis. It's a song, <laughs> super. But like so many ancient songs, this was contemporary pretty much, like 1264, 1265. We have the words, it was written in Middle English, a similar sort of language to uh, Chaucer, but we don't have a melody. That's long since lost. So, sat right here with Dog 
I'm going to have a quick delve to see if I can hearken the melody that lingers in the song of the skylark and the pattering of the rain and the occasional roar of the 737s above. So yeah, here we go. Forgive me, this is rough. It's going to be rough, but you know. Setteth all still and hearkeneth to me The King of Alamein by my low tay Thirty thousand pound asked hey For to mark the pace in the country And so he did a more Richard, that thou be ever to Richard Trichin shall thou never more Don't be Trichard Richard, that thou be ever Trichard Trichin shall thou never more Can you hear the birds going? Richard, that thou be ever Trichard Trichin shall thou never more Richard, that thou be ever Trichard Trichin shall thou never more Richard, that thou be ever Trichard Trichin shall thou never more Richard, that thou be ever Trichard Trichin shall thou never more So I'm going to head to the Abbey this morning It's where Henry III and, and pals Edward and Richard slept the night before Simon of the Strong Hill rolled down into the town and diffed them to make English parliamentary democracy. Good morning. And there's Lewis Castle up yonder, one of the first Norman castles to be built. And there's the moon. We're all here. There's a dog face. Dog face. It's before breakfast and I'm peckish. So I wanted to see if, if a different version of the song of the Battle of Lewis emerges here from within the heart of the royalist side of things. Sitteth all stiller and hearkeneth to me The King of Alamein by my lote Thirty thousand pound asked he for to make the peace in the country And so he did a more Richard, that thou ever be Richard Trichin shalt thou never more Nice, well, clear as day isn't it? Richard, that thou be ever Trichard Trichin shalt thou never more I mean, what would be interesting to learn exactly how far from the original I truly am. Surely many miles, magpie. I wonder what they ate for breakfast after the battle. Beef and beer, I reckon. I'm looking for eggs and tea. <laughs> All right, so I've got about 10 seconds of footage before we run out. I just want to say thanks. I'm on my way to Furl, we're going to sleep in the church tonight. Thanks so much for watching, the best to you, and walk well, see you on the path, bye bye.